Dr. Sumed. Ah, yes, recording. Uh, uh, so, Sunil, yeah. uh, just the uh, plan. Shall I do the intro? Uh, Saurav, is it Saurav? Can you stop sharing your screen? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar on the hand and wrist. This is the last of the present series of teaching webinars, which were started out in 2021. And uh, uh, it has been immensely successful. And we have to thank all the people who have come along and talked and, and, and taught on these. Uh, my co-host for this is uh, Sunil Garg, our honorary secretary. And I thank him for that. Uh, we have uh, uh, some excellent speakers this morning and uh, they need no major introduction, uh, but just in terms of uh, how the, uh, the batting order, so to speak, will follow, we will first have Sumit Talwalkar from Wrightington Hospital. He's a consultant hand and wrist surgeon, and he needs no uh, long introduction. He's been passionate about teaching and training. He's also the medical director of the surgical, uh, of the surgical division and uh, recently been elected to the Council of the Hand Society for which we congratulate him. Uh, after that, we will have Anandaria, uh, who's a consultant at King's College Hospital and our past president as well. Uh, after that will be uh, Saurabh Agarwal. Uh, hi, Anand. Uh, and uh, he's a, a consultant at Princess Royal Hospital at Bromley and will be talking to us on perilunate injuries. And finally, Jonathan Jones, a consultant orthopedic and hand surgeon at uh, uh, Peterborough Hospitals at Northwest Anglia NHS Trust. Uh, he'll be talking to us on how to assess the injured hand. Uh, so if you have questions, which you, I hope we all have uh, on this uh, webinar and on the speakers, please put it in the Q&A box and we will uh, attempt to answer that. Uh, with the first talk, we will do the question and answer immediately after that. Uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Talwalkar has to leave, but uh, the rest will be at the end. And if there are any burning issues, we can take them up straight away. So without further ado, can I ask Sumit for you to uh, set off with your talk? Thank you very much, Sumit. Thanks. I think um, you can see the first slide, yes? Yes. Yeah. So many thanks for inviting me, Sunil and Amit, um, for this webinar. Uh, we know that rheumatoid arthritis, as far as a, a chronic disease is concerned, has sort of bucked the trend a little bit because most victories over chronic diseases are very hard fought and uh, defeat is consistent. But here it's been a little bit different. So what we've seen during training and what our senior colleagues have seen is very different to what we are seeing. So there's been a, a sheer reduction in volume in um, actually what occurs and um, the reason for surgeries as well has, has reduced significantly. Um, the age old battle between the rheumatologist and the surgeon continues. And to an extent, because the numbers are low and due to the absence of the adequate skill base within the, the general hand community, uh, this particular problem and issues between the rheumatologist and surgeon can cause problems. So what I'm going to do is to just give you a, a bit of a bird's eye view of what I feel rheumatoid hand and wrist surgery is about now. And then we'll talk a little bit about MCP joint replacements and uh, boutonnier and spawn neck deformities. So how do you go from the left to the right uh, in terms of the, the standard rheumatoid cascade? Uh, we always like to buttonhole or put things in silos when you look at pathology. And I, I have to warn you that these rules don't necessarily um, apply now because of the disease has morphed slightly under the influence of the biologics. Um, I mean, clearly rheumatology, rheumatoid arthritis as a disease hasn't had the chance to read Green's textbook of medicine. So don't, don't, don't worry if this does not necessarily occur in this particular chronology. So classically speaking, we know that the first disorder is synovitis that develops over the ulna corner with carpal supination where the carpus falls away from the ulna, making the distal ulna appear prominent. And I think that's an important distinction. And once that, that happens with shortening of the ulna pillar of the wrist, as it were, 
the hand happily collapses into a, a position of manus varus, causing extensive subluxation, stretching of the collaterals and sagittal hoods, which is made worse by the anatomy, specifically the asymmetric appearance of the, um, the condyles, the fact that flexors are phylogenetically so much stronger than extensors, and eventually when the deformity is present for a long period of time because of the chronic pull of the intrinsics, the deformity becomes fixed. You end up with subluxation and you get what's called as the full house. So these can be quite complex deformities that, that, that we see. It's imperative that you take a, a good history requiring uh, functional um, 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 problems that patients have. One useful question is, what are the things that you could do that you can't do anymore that we can help you with? So it's a sort of multi-team uh, approach. It's very important to involve your occupational therapists and a good examination is very important. What is crucially important is to hear what the patient says. So whilst you could spend a lot of time looking at these esoteric deformities in the hand, patients probably come for nodules at the level of his elbow. The other thing is a lot of these patients are patients that have been following up with you for a very long time. They don't complain, they've got chronic disorders. And it's very embarrassing if a couple of years later you find that they've developed severe carpal tunnel syndrome under your watch. And that's not uncommon. So these are some direct questions that you do ask, have to ask these patients about how they're doing, etc. I won't labor too much on medication and anesthetic assessment, but in this new age of Volant, it's really important for us to look at the patient positioning. So if you want someone to lie in a, in a particular position for a long period of time, does this person have adequate elbow extension? Are they able to abduct the shoulder adequately? Are they able to stay in one particular place for a long period of time? We need to look at these issues. Post-COVID, poor skin is, is not just the usual poor skin of a, of a rheumatoid, but you have individuals who've been on these uh, disease-modifying drugs for a long period of time. I uh, had this person who was assessed in GP land and then in pre-op while they were on this COVID pathway and we had to do these um, revalidations and they said, oh, they've got this little um, lesion on the skin which keeps discharging, which is an infection. And I'm sure the more astute people amongst you have realized that this is a squamous cell carcinoma. So these are the sort of things that you have to be constantly aware of with, with patients with rheumatoid arthritis, people who trust you, people who've been following up with you for such a long period of time. Surgical principles, we know all about lower limbs first, start proximally, work distally, wrist before fingers, and I had uh, mentioned patient positioning again. The surgical principles um, that John Stanley uh, propounded so many years ago hold true now. Nerves come before flexor tendons, the wrist comes before the thumb, MCP joints before extensor tendons, then PIP joints and DIP joints and so on. So it's just useful to in a, in a complex patient with lots and lots of things wrong with them, it's very useful to have this at the back of your um, um, list of things to do. Commonest presentation, you would end up with sinovitis at the ulnar aspect of the, the wrist with a, a, pre, uh, a, a sort of a pre von Jackson type lesion, or you have a large sinovetic mass over the back. Standard approach, I, I prefer the third bed, as you can see the EPL is exteriorized on the right. Uh, once this is done, you have the option of either going subperiostally or I tend to go within the fourth compartment and then exteriorize that and the EDM. Looking at the back of the wrist, a uh, very useful landmark, and it's very important to have landmarks in patients with rheumatoid because there's very little by way of normal anatomy when you, when you see these, is the back of the, the triquetrum. You have a little tuberosity, which is usually palpable, and everything really arises from there. You have the DIC and the radio, radio lunar triquetral ligament, the two important ligaments at the back of the wrist. If you forget about all the other ligaments, but just remember these two, they, they will really help you in terms of approaching the wrist in a ligament sparing fashion. So you get in there, do whatever you have to do, and then exteriorize the EPL and try and stitch back the extensor retinaculum because patients do not like bowstringing. So this is a typical example. We've gone in there, you can see this huge panis you identify these structures, you remove all the, all the tissue, and you can see um, uh, we, we, we've been able to almost get an, a complete clearance. Various strategies when it comes to the extensor retinaculum, um, sometimes you can do V-shaped cuts and lengthen the retinaculum to a sort of a, a, a plasty, 
which which allows you to close something over the extensors to make sure that you don't end up with with issues and you can get quite a good clearance with these and prevent eventual rupture neglected problems you can end up with significant issues these are all four tendons which were ruptured because this patient wasn't attended to sooner rather than later and then you really have to use your your imagination so what do we do with ruptures they are often painless very important that you check with the patient to try and find out what it is that they want for example an epl rupture is not the end of the world but an fpl rupture that's a diff completely different kettle of fish really quite important to have this differential diagnosis in mind when it comes to drop fingers with rheumatoid patients you've got to think of the radial nerve palsy and you can use the tenodesis effect to rule that out ruptured tendon our good old friend the von jackson lesion sublux tendons within the valleys when the when the tendon pops out and lies within the the meta, in, the, in the valley between the metacarpals that can cause an extensor lag don't forget locked trigger fingers can also present as drop fingers locked osteophytes can also be issues so there's a lot to think about when it comes to a drop finger it's not just always an extensor rupture and these are some of the the dilemmas that you have to to think about you know it, it's just vanity if you think that we treat these as tendon transfers whatever do we do ends up being essentially a tenodesis the lots and lots of surgical procedures that we do as rheumatoid surgeons but uh, because of the exigencies of time i'm going to just restrict myself to a few things let's talk about rheumatoid mcp joint disease this is something we do a lot of in writington clearly in terms of numbers it may be something that you may or may not be exposed to um swanson's prosthesis the you know the the it has stood the test of time to 1966 seems to work extremely well the stability of the hinge increase the loading on the stem but the problem is at the level of the hinge uh, so essentially what happens here is that because of repetitive movements it's not uncommon for the hinge to break and this is where the new flex is of um, a significant advantage because it is pre flexed at 30 degrees so theoretically and what we've shown with some papers at writington is that in terms of survivorship the new flex does not break uh, these are the popular um complications of synovial joints that have been quoted in the literature uh, i have never seen a single case of silicon synovitis metallosis only occurs in those individuals obviously these are very uh, old follow ups patients who've had the grommets put in uh, one of the things that you have to remember is that the capsule that forms around these deformities is is so uh, so strong in a lot of cases that even a broken implant is very well tolerated and it's only when you have a a coronal deformity that causes significant issues that patients come to you for surgery one important point is that one mustn't perform the the new fangled um unconstrained prostheses the ones that look like mini knees in rheumatoid arthritis because this is essentially an unconstrained situation you do not have the option of performing these procedures in 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 these patients so few points about mcp joint replacements i use the smiling face incision that's the extensor tendon that you can see with the sagittal hood um, you release the extensor tendon from the ulna side and try and place it in a position of comfort which will allow you easy access to the joint some cases you have to put it back into the mc in the valley in other cases you can get it over the metacarpal and move it radially when you get in it looks like a complete mess and the only way you can actually see something is by performing an osteotomy so once you take the head of the metacarpal off suddenly you can see a lot of things so one of the key steps in making sure that your mcp joint replacement is successful is the volar plate release and i can you can see my mcdonald going into the front just subperiosteally you get a lot of minus marks obviously if you cut the the flexor tendon at this stage and what you need to be able to do is to deliver this proximal phalanx into the joint so once you've done that you know that you've done a complete release sometimes you have to take a little bit of distal bone out and once that's done do your osteoph osteophytectomies and and enter the canal prepare the canals to accept the the right sized mcp joint and you can see that there you follow that through with closure essentially you do a, a release on the lateral side and a repair on the um sorry a re release on the ulna side and a, and a double refing and a repair on the on the radial side to to obtain correction and you can see what the corrected and uncorrected digits look like on the right and once you finish the surgery this is what it looks like this is an important paper 
a prospective study of three large cohorts in the US and the UK, patients who self-selected either to have surgery or no surgery. Really quite important to see that three, five, and seven years, the surgical group did significantly better um, and appeared to do well with an improvement that continued right up to the seven-year point. Survivorship appears to be excellent and really in patients who have this ulnar drift, once they've had an adequate and proper occupational therapy consult, it's really quite important to, to offer them surgery. And you can use this paper as one of um, uh, to, to quote outcomes. So these are some of the technique gems which we, we, we've covered. Really important to, to deliver that proximal phalanx into the joint in order to ensure that you have adequate um, um, release. Some of the harbingers of doom, a radially deviated wrist, flexion deformity, stiff PIP joints, and SLE. When you have a radially deviated wrist, sometimes what you may need to do is a fusion, a Chamay fusion also works, or a extensor ECRL to ECU transfer. Flexion deformities of the fourth and fifth CMC joints, something that people don't always realize. They very often need fusion. This is a rare deformity, but the one that can cause significant problems to the surgeon is fixed PIP joint contractures. And if you try doing a P P MCP joint replacement in someone who has these deformities, firstly, it will fail. Secondly, during surgery, you're very, very uncomfortable. So proceed with care. SLE, somehow the results don't, don't tend to be great. You end up with uh, early deformities and it's not unusual to have to go in and revise these sooner rather than later. So in summary, they do seem to work. They do stand the test of time, but you do need to be aware of the, the limitations of the, the procedure. So let's move quickly into some finger deformities, talking about swan necks, where you get hyperextension at the level of the PIP joint and a flexion deformity at the DIP. Nail buffs classification. As far as practicing hand surgeons are concerned, um, the two points that you really look at is the first where you have a, a supple deformity and the fourth where there's significant arthritis. And then two and three is essentially something that you make up as you go along. So what it really represents is a spectrum of anomalies, it, starting off with a very mobile PIP joint, which then moves on to something which is slightly more tight. And then as you go down the spectrum, you do more and more as you go along. So as I said, if it's very mobile, you could treat it with a splint, uh, a lateral band release on its own. Sometimes you could be lucky to get away with that. Uh, but the reality is that by the time patients get to you from GP land and from the rheumatologist, by then you do need to proceed with these procedures. So just as a list, once you've released the lateral bands, you do a dorsal capsulotomy. I use a, a beaver blade for my lateral releases and uh, then go ahead and perform extensive capsulotomies, et cetera, like the previous slide. One of my favorite procedures is the Zankali procedure, where you redirect the lateral band. So you'd free the lateral band, as you can see on the side. You'd translocate it volar to the PIP joint, and then identify the flexor sheath. Once the flexor sheath is identified, I make a, a little hole in the A3 pulley, and then plumb the lateral band into the translocated sheath, as you can see in this slide. So what was essentially an extensor now becomes a flexor. And when it contracts through the extensors, it prevents that finger from extending. It's a very, very useful procedure and incredibly easy to do um, under a local anesthetic. Someone with uh, cerebral palsy with this swan neck really doesn't work well with a Zankalis type procedure. So for this, you need an FDS loop, as you can see. You, uh, through a volar approach, identify the A2 pulley, preoperatively make sure that the patient has an FDS and FDP. You might be caught out if this is a FDP dependent hand. And then what you essentially do is you release the one band of the FDS proximally. And once you release the one band of the FDS proximally, as you can see in this slide, you take that band of FDS and then loop it back to itself so that you can, you can close, uh, you, you create a flexor moment at the level of the PIP joint and that corrects the deformity. Looking at Boutonnier deformities, this is something which is always met with a significant amount of disappointment, certainly in my hands. Um, functionally, they seem to be better tolerated in swan necks. And one of the things I always tell our trainees is that if you ever had a choice between a swan neck and a boutonnier deformity, I would always off, um, go for a boutonnier. Um, and I really do what um, um, great men uh, have advised. And as far as possible in a rheumatoid patient with a boutonnier deformity, Apart from fusion, I tend not to do a lot of soft tissue procedures. 
flex attendant tenosynovitis and ruptures is very important to address the cause. If it's the thumb, MCP fusion is a very, very good procedure. Two-stage procedures don't tend to, to, to work very well. So I'd just like to end by quoting Willie Suter. Uh, if you're a young consultant or a youngish consultant, um, this patient with rheumatoid arthritis is going to grow old with you. So the first thing you pick, and probably the only surgery you should do right in the beginning is to pick something that works rather than starting off with something very complicated and always be dictated by what the, the patient actually wants. Thank you. So Thank you. Okay, I'll great. stop sharing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Sumit. Thank you for uh, dealing with this rather complex topic in a very clear, concise manner. Uh, are there any Q&A that we can pick up, Sunil? Uh, I have one question. Yeah, there's nothing on the Q&A. Okay, right so now. can I ask you on, uh, well, it's a two, two parts to one question. Uh, you know, there was a uh, role for sinovectomy in rheumatoid hands in the past, and the Europeans seem to be very keen on that. Uh, do you see any of any need for that nowadays, particularly because of the DMARD uh, you know, situation? and the fact that patients do not present to us uh, with uh, rheumatoid as frequently as they did before for surgical care. And the second question is, what's your approach to managing rheumatoid nodules? I see often patients who come to us with uh, this large nodule and their joints are okay, but the nodules are a problem. Uh, would you, do you think that there's any role for assessing these with uh, sort of say vasculitis assessment, skin condition, et cetera, and be somewhat cautious with removing them at the request of patients? Thank you. Yeah. So in answer to your first question, um, um, Amit, uh, there, there has been a significant amount of uh, reduction, isn't it, in, in sheer numbers. So when you were a fellow in Writington, I guess you probably had a rheumatoid patient or at least two rheumatoid patients in every one of John Stanley's lists. And then a few years later, when I went, or many years later after I went, um, essentially things had changed. Within one generation, um, they have effectively managed to treat what was essentially quite a significant problem. I still feel that early sinovectomy in appropriate patients, so you still have these diseases or patients with disease that, that are recalcitrant, um, they do need um, sinovectomy and they need it early Otherwise, you end up with lots of tendon ruptures. And in answer to your second question about nodules, um, I tend to be conservative like yourself. Uh, our rheumatologists do approach them to try and reduce the disease activity. Sometimes pain, painful nodules become painless. But I find the only thing that really works is surgical excision, conservative surgical excision. So don't try to take it all out. Don't try and take the skin out. Just take the bit that's painful and uh, leave the rest behind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions for Sumit? As he probably has Jonathan's got his hand up. Sorry? Sir? Saurabh? Oh, um, oh, uh, Jonathan. Yeah, there you are. I really enjoyed your talk, uh, Sumit. Um, it was a, a very nice uh, resume and uh, a nice refresher for me. Thank you for that. Um, I've had some challenging uh, rheumatoid uh, patients recently, and sometimes you get them quite late from the rheumatologist. And uh, the, the subluxation of the joint is very, very severe and some, some with, with uh, intrinsic tightness. Um, so I wondered if there was any sort of contraindications or, or um, so a comment on the threshold for um, MCP joint replacements, perhaps ones that you would not do and ones that you would do something different as a, as a staged approach. Yeah, well, that's a very good question, Jonathan, because the cases that now come to us tend to be a very advanced with very tight deformities. So you could get an, um, an extensor tendon that is now volar. You know, it's, it's sublux to the extent that is volar and the little fingers almost hanging out. I find that if you take more bone off, you can still correct those as long as the PIP joint is not flexed. So if you have a fi fixed deformity at the PIP joint with a very deformed finger, that is an absolute contraindication, I feel, to MCP joint replacements because it's very, very difficult to do. So the only thing to take away, I suppose, from what I've learned, is that if you have fixed PIP joint deformities in addition to everything that happens with the MCP, don't try and do these replacements. Uh, I don't know what the solution is. Maybe you could try fusing them even, but I wouldn't replace them because they just, 
they just fail very quickly and, and and you're in a very uncomfortable position because it's something you've done many times and suddenly you find that nothing that you do works sure. <laughs> thanks very much thank you. thank you thank you subed shall we now move on thank you for your time today uh, so our, our next speaker is uh, mr anand arya uh, he's uh, uh, one of the most prolific uh, writers and presenters and has been a past president of the british indian orthopedic society he works as a consultant upper limb surgeon at king's college hospital and he's going to talk to us on carpal metacarpal joint arthritis of the thumb i'm very grateful to you anand for coming along and talking uh, thank you thank, thanks thanks amit and sunil um, okay uh, can you see the screen yes very good okay uh, thanks thanks very much and amit and sunil and for asking me to talk on this topic and uh, uh, even though the, the title of my topic is the management of the arthritis uh, i have covered in sort of in brief sort of you know kind of a snapshot of everything about the thumb basal joint arthritis and had targeted it to the uh, fcs orth candidates so try to make it you know, to the point and quite simplistic uh, as as i'm told i work in the kings college hospital london and i'm mainly an upper limb surgeon <clears throat> so the uh, the first cmc joint of the hand is a quite special joint and as you probably know that anatomy wise that it is a, a concave convex joint like a saddle shaped which is concave at in one axis and the convex in the other axis. Uh, it, it is probably the most mobile joint into the wrist and hand and has a wide range of movement in different axes. Opposition is the unit movement of this joint and by which the thumb is able to oppose different fingers. And in fact, this is the main difference between the humans and the lower primates that they are not able to oppose their thumb. Uh, because of the mobility and the shape, this joint is subjected to a lot of stresses throughout the life. And that's why the arthritis is very common. In fact, this is the joint which is most commonly affected by arthritis. And in their lifetime, one in three women and one in eight men would have the arthritis of first CMCJ. Even though it is a very mobile joint, it has a very little osseous constraints and it mainly depends on the capsular ligamentous structures for its stability. And when we talk of the ligaments there, everyone knows about the beak ligament or the volar ligament, which is also called an interior or palmar oblique ligament. It's quite a, a strong ligament going from the tubercular trapezium to the first metacarpal. And it is considered the main you know, culprit when it becomes lax or loose then the, the base of the thumb starts dislocate subluxating dorsal radially. But there is a view now that dorsal ligament of, the, of this joint is also important, even though it is a weak ligament, but it restrains the dorsal subluxation of the uh, base of the metacarpal. And unless it is stretched or attenuated, then the, uh, the subluxation would not happen. But I think for the exam purpose, it might be useful just to you stick to the traditional lines that it is the bowler ligament, which is the most important one. And as I mentioned earlier, this joint has uh, a lot of movements. The flexion, extension, adduction, abduction of the thumb are at right angles to the movements of the fingers. And the abduction sometimes is described as a palmar abduction and a radial abduction. And the opposition is a combination of all these movements, including rotation, and a pronation of the thumb. A patient which is presenting with the first CMCJ arthritis would invariably talk about the pain, which may be constant, but mainly happens on any use of the hand or thumb, either during activities of daily living or in the other works there. And the pain is obviously increased with the grip, whether it's a pinch grip or uh, the uh, key, pinch, key grip and uh, uh, doing the common normal things like writing, playing music, DIY, using computer mice, all these things causes pain. Uh, in the later stages, the thumb starts becoming instability and the 
uh, dorsal uh, radial subluxation of the metacarpal happens, which causes the enlargement of the base of the thumb. In the initial stages, it might be because of the synovitis. And in the late stages, when the thumb starts getting fixed into that position, then uh, the person is not able to abduct it, meaning that finds it difficult to hold the large objects there. In the advanced stage, you would find this classical picture when the dorsal radial subluxation of the thumb metacarpal becomes fixed, then metacarpal becomes adducted. It causes compensatory hyperextension of MCPJ and a flexion of the IPJ, uh, producing this typical zigzag deformity, which is almost pathognomonic of this condition there. In the physical examination, uh, obviously tenderness would be there, joint would be enlarged initially due to synovitis and later due to deformity. It may be lax in the beginning, but usually tend to be stiff later. And sometimes you may find a click there. The grind test is commonly used to, to test the uh, arthritis of this joint in which basically you put an axial pressure onto the uh, first metacarpal and try to rotate it. While doing this test, you must be careful because sometimes it can be very painful. The second test which normally is done that with the longitudinal traction, you try to reduce the subluxation by putting the pressure dorsally onto the base of the metacarpal. And in that way, you know, you are pushing this against the, uh, the medial osteophyte and it can cause the pain. And if you observe the thumb when the person is using it in the normal activities, then you can see that the, the dorsal subluxation is accentuated. And one very important thing is that, that uh, quite often uh, these hands may be associated with a silent carpal tunnel and there might be a significant wasting of the thinner muscles and that should not be overlooked. These are the, some differential diagnoses when you are seeing a case of suspected first CMCJ arthritis. So decurvance can present it like that, scaffold non-union, FCR tendonitis, and STT osteoarthritis must be kept in the view. The, the neuritis of the branches of superficial radial nerve can also cause the pain. And uh, uh, the referred pain from the carpal tunnel or uh, MP joint also can cause this kind of symptoms there. Sometimes injecting the first CMCJ can differentiate it. In terms of the imaging, the, the thumb uh, basal joint is kept uh, at a uh, 45 degree angle to the, uh, the, to the finger joints. So if you take a true AP and lateral view of the hand, you would get two oblique view of the first CMCJ. So basically you need to take the two oblique views for seeing the, the AP and the lateral view of this joint. There are some special views which uh, shows this joint very beautifully. Always look for the STT joint arthritis when you are looking for first CMCJ arthritis. The stress view sometimes is useful in which you press the both thumb tips together, keeping the nails parallel to the plate, which may accentuate this deformity as shown in the picture on the left side. CT scan has a use, CT scan has, has its use. If you're trying to do something which would, which would sort of matter if the structure of the trapezium is, is not sort of right. So sometimes if you plan to do a first CMCJ replacement and you wanted to see if there's any cyst in the trapezium or not, in those situations, uh, the CT scan would be useful. MRI scan, I don't think has any role in the management of this condition. Um, if you are exam going and if you get a case of the first CMCJ arthritis, you would invariably be asked about this classification. And if you do not know the Eaton and Littler staging, you would not pass that case. So the stage one is a, either a normal looking X-ray or there would be widening of this joint uh, because of the early stage, which is synovitis stage. If the joint is subluxed, it would normally be less than one third. In the stage two, which is slightly more advanced stage, rather than the widening, you would see the joint space narrowing and subluxation up to one third of the joint. And if an osteophyte or loose body is present on the medial side, it would be less than two millimeter and the STT would be normal. In the stage three, which is the further progression of the disease, you would see a medial osteophyte or loose body more than two millimeter 
and the joint would be subluxed more than one third. And in the stage four, there would be a, a sort of pantrapegial arthritis. So that means there would be STT joint arthritis with advanced degenerative changes along with the severe subluxation there. In the examination, you always have to ask about the non-operative treatment, which you all know about activity modification, NSAIDs, splints, and the steroid injection. The splint, no, the splint work in these cases by restricting the abduction and stopping the subluxation while using the hand. The steroid injection, uh, I do it myself in the clinic. I first inject the local anesthetic and so that I can walk the needle uh, to the joint, use an orange needle there. And normally you can find the joint. You might have to put a longitudinal traction onto the thumb if the joint is quite sort of narrowed down, but you can do it in the clinic yourself. When the, the question of the operative treatment comes, then obviously when the non-operative treatment has failed, patient still has significant pain and dysfunction, then you should consider it. Surgical treatment need to be individualized and it based not only just the stage of the disease, but the age of the patient, the dominance, the demand, and actually what is that patient wants. So with the same stage, uh, the treatment may be different in two different patients. In the pre-op assessment before surgery should include the proximal and distal joint and certainly the arthritis of the STTJ. The stage one and two, uh, it is sort of not very common that surgery would be required and the non-operative means should give the relief to the patient. But if the surgery is required, the volar ligament reconstruction is one surgical procedure, which is quite popular using a distally based strip of the FCR which is passed to the base of the first metacarpal and looped back upon itself. And then the joint is stabilized. It strengthened the uh, big ligament also. <clears throat> the osteotomy of the uh, first metacarpal base has been described as a treatment. It is considered, it is said to be altering the forces across the joint. It reduces the subluxation and unloads the volar aspect of the joint, which is, you know, the initially, which is involved into this arthritic process. Um, it certainly improves the abduction. It is technically difficult and has a significant you know, a share of complications, including non-union and malunion. And I do confess that I've never seen it, never done it. The another common uh, procedure nowadays for stage one and two is the arthroscopic washout. And it is a reasonably successful procedure in terms of the pain relief or basically buying more time before you know, proceeding to the more sort of uh, radical surgical procedures there. It is uh, commonly done in the younger patients where other surgical procedures are not indicated and you need a small needle scope for it, which is quite, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 soft and which is not, not you know, just quite uh, fragile and you need to be careful to, to use it. It's technically not difficult. You only have two portals there and you can easily find them and the cartilage can be directly visualized. Synovectomy can done at the same time, and if any loose bodies that can be removed. Uh, I've done quite a few of these, and results are variable. Uh, the literature doesn't say much about this procedure. The, in the stage three and four, the two main procedures would be the arthrodesis and the arthroplasty. The arthrodesis should not be uh, taken, you know, uh, just as a light procedure. It's a quite important procedure, and especially in the younger patients and who have a high demand onto the hand because the arthrodes, a good arthrodesis would stabilize the thumb and then a stable and pain-free thumb would be a very useful thumb. So, uh, so it is suitable in a, in a sort of, in a very limited defined group of the patient and also the patient who have the hypermobility of the joint. Uh, it should not be done in the people who have only grade one disease or in whom the STT or MCPJ arthritis is present. If you mention about the arthrodesis, you would invariably be asked about the position of the arthrodesis. So you can work it out the position by say, when your fingers are clenched, when the fist is clenched, then thumb should lie on the top of the middle phalanx of index finger. And if you do it in your own hand, you can work it out that it requires about 40 degrees of palmar abduction 20 degrees of radial deviation uh, and, and pronation 
uh, of the thumb. And with this position, if you want, if you want to orthodise the thumb, you need to keep it in this position. Several different techniques are there. You can use any one of them. Either you can cut the bone parallel or you can make a cup and dome dissection. And similarly for fixation, you can use staples, tension band wiring, headless candidate screws or a small plate. But it's not easy, it's technically difficult. Again, has got a fair share of complications, including about 10% of non-union rate. And also that after the arthrodesis, the opposition to little finger can become difficult. And in about half of the cases, they would not be able to do it. The trapeziectomy I tested simple and, and quite successful procedure for this thing. And the person who described it first actually had the operation performed on himself and then restarted to operate. The, the people in which the, the trapeziectomy fails, the common regions are the proximal migration of first metacarpal, intracarpal instability, weakness of the grip, and late recurrence of the pain. And there is quite a good evidence in the literature that there is not much difference between trapeziectomy with and without ligament reconstruction. Uh, I'll just skip this slide. The, in the trapeziectomy, you can use the incision, either a volar incision or a dorsoradial incision. The sensory branches of the superficial radial nerve and radial, radial artery need to be protected. And nowadays, uh, I also do it, most of my colleagues do it, that they stabilize the base of the first metacarpal by using suture anchors or putting some sort of suture between the bone and the, the, the nearby soft tissues there. I also use the POP for six weeks after trapeziectomy. There are several different modifications of the trapeziectomies. You probably all know about it, LRTI, ligament reconstruction, interposition, but there are you know, several reports now that any of these procedures, uh, uh, they, are, they do not make any functional difference than the simple trapeziectomy. The interposition arthroplasty is another thing. Uh, we used to do artillon spacer, which is like a T-shaped things. And it's two flaps are fixed to the both sides of the joint. It went into disrepute because of the significant complications being reported from US. It was taken off the market. There's another spacer available. It's a pyrocarbon spacer. And I haven't used it, but I was told that in the suitable patient, it can be a good alternative. The first CMC replacement has has become popular from last decade or so. There are several reports that it gives good results, although it is not very common, not very popular in the UK as yet, but in the Europe, US and other countries, it is being practiced quite a lot. The first CMCJ replacement provides stability to the joint, as long as a good mobility, good strength and faster pain relief. And it is also quicker return to work and cosmetically superior there. It is indicated in the grade three or four disease, more in the elderly patients, although I've spoken to the, some people and they say they have done in the people as young as late forties. And obviously if there's a significant STT arthritis, it would not give complete pain relief and it is not very suitable for heavy manual workers there. Uh, the third generation prosthesis has come into the market. They are dual mobility prosthesis and they give better range of movement and the problem of uh, dislocation, which was there with the earlier version has almost completely disappeared. I've used, I use this third generation dual mobility prosthesis uh, in the, the, the different uh, brands available. I use one called Touch and I'm very happy with the result. It would be, it would be good to, to remember some landmark papers. Uh, if you have a case of the first CMCJ arthritis, you might most likely would be asked about it. So I've just given the reference of these four papers and I'm sure this presentation would be on the BIOS website and then you can take note of it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Anand, very quickly, there's a question on Q&A. Yeah. What, what to do if a thumb CMCG replacement dislocates post-operatively? Very quick answer and then we go to the next one. Okay, so, so I had the same case there. It was the second generation of CMCJ replacement called MOTEC, which was not a bipolar. It was dislocated. I had to take it to theater and I, I revised it by using a longer neck there. And I, uh, uh, it hasn't dislocated again. It's more than a year now. So that is one option. But if it doesn't work, then the fallback option is trapeziectomy. Thank you, Anand. Very, very important topic. I think we can we can go on this for several hours. It's, it's so common and very well presented. Thank you. 
Uh, Amit, over to you. Yeah. Hi. So uh, our next speaker is Saura Bagarwal. He is a consultant at the Princess Royal Hospital in Bromley and uh, an excellent teacher. And uh, I'm very grateful to you, Saurabh, for coming along and talking, despite the fact that you're on a sabbatical in India. So thank you very much. You're on mute, Saurabh. You're on mute. OK, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yes, we okay. can. Thank you. So thank you, Prof. Amit and Sunil, for your kind invitation. And thank you all for your time. Uh, it's a bit exhaustive topic, and I put a lot of operative pictures. So I'm going to jump through some theory slides, uh, if I may. So uh, I work at Princess Royal Hospital. Now, our topic today is peri-unit injuries, uh, some pearls in recognition and management. And I'm going to talk about pure ligament injuries, then mixed ligament and bone injuries, a bit about dorsal approach and uh, then uh, tips and tricks. So acute ligament injuries can be scapholeunate, unotriacutral, or perilunate. Now, intrinsic ligaments are within the corpus. So origin and insertion is between two bones, for example, scaphoid and a lunate. Extrinsic, however, bridge the carpal bones to the radius or the metacarpals, and they can be uh, volar ligaments or dorsal ligaments. Uh, intrinsic ligaments are the ones which I've shown on the left side. As a surgeon, I'm concerned about scapholeunate and lunotricutral. Extrinsic, on the volar side, they're in the shape of two Vs, and they're centered over lunate and capitate. So you'll have a radiolunate and an alnolunate, and then you have a radio scaphocapitate and an alnocapitate. And now these are thickenings of capsules. So the space between them is the uh, area of weakness. That's the space of Poirier. That's where lunate will come out in the front in a stage four Mayfield lunate dislocation. On the dorsum, again, it's in the shape of a V, but this time centered over tricutrum. So it will extend from radius to tricutrum and then from the dorsal carpal row. Biomechanics, I'm going to jump, otherwise I won't finish in time. But I put three concepts, link concept, uh, column concept, and rows concept. Uh, you can read it at your leisure and you can bring it up in the exam for discussion if asked. Types of carpal instability. So dissociative is between the carpal bones. So it can be between scapholeunate. So you can have a scapholeunate ligament rupture or a tricutral ligament rupture. Non-dissociative is between the carpal rows. Instability complex is your transcaphoid parilunates. So it involves ligaments and bones or it can be a pure lesser arc injury then instability adaptive is actually not the instability within the carpus, but carpus is trying to adapt, for, as you can see on the picture on the right. So for example, in a malunited distal radius, your lunate will follow uh, your radius and capitate will tend to flex to balance the forces. So coming to scapholeunate, so we know it's a hyperextension injury. This is a sort of presentation in the clinic. Patient will have pain and swelling on the dorsal radial aspect. You need to know the lines of Gilula and then your scapholeunate angle. So it is basically an angle between the longitudinal axis of scaphoid and lunate. Normal is around 45 to 60. More than 70, 75, 80 is your uh, DC in your scapholeunate. So if I show you the radiographs, this is how it's going to look on a PA view. Scaphoid will flex, lunate extends. So if you trace the boundary, which, which is what you should always do on a PA, it looks triangular shape. Now important, lunate always looks triangular, whether it extends in a DC or flexes in a VC. Remember that point. Now lateral radiograph, very important for perilunate. You can see lunate has extended, scaphoid has flexed. Your scapholeunate angle is around 80. So you know it's a scapholeunate uh, rupture. Goals, of course, in the long term is you do not want carpus to collapse, which can result in painful instability and then arthritis. For the short term, you want to deal with the pain and swelling. Now, important here is early diagnosis. So if it's a bando scapholeunate, yes, carry sign and uh, your scapholeunate angles, anybody can pick it up. For those subtle scapholeunate, 
where there's only a intrinsic ligament rupture, but extrinsics are intact. That's where you will get very subtle sort of a sign on a lateral view. So the important thing will be lunate and scaphoid, this relationship. So on a lateral X-ray, the proximal pole tends to sit within the lunate. And in very subtle ones, this proximal pole will tend to drift out. So very important as a habit to look for this relation between lunate and scaphoid on a lateral X-ray. Then of course, uh, important to know uh, or pick up those slacks. So for example, for example, in the radiograph here, you can already see there's an arthritis between capital lunate joint. So it's already a slack three. Now, radio lunate is like a ball and socket joint. It's very hard to get arthritis there. So for staging purposes, I would always do a risco, look at the joint myself, then stage it. If it's a slack four, and patient is symptomatic, then you offer a total risk fusion. If it's a slack three and patient is symptomatic, then you offer a four corner fusion. Treatment wise, yes, you can do close reductions, uh, but in my practice, I would do an open reduction, do K wires and stabilize the ligaments, which is what we'll see in our uh, operative cases, clinical examples. So before I take you to cases, all these parilunate injuries can be addressed through a dorsal approach. So important to one, to know this, to simplify it, break it into three steps. First step is your skin flaps. So if you take a good sort of flap, i.e. fat goes with the skin, then your cutaneous nerves as I marked here should go with the fat. This is how you protect them. Second step is your retinaculum. So find EPL, radialize it. And then as Sumed showed us, you can do a subperiosteal elevation of second and your fourth compartment. And third step is to do a radial based capsular flap uh, and then you will start seeing your carpal bones. And at this stage, you can address your ligaments, you can address individual carpal bones or your parilunate injuries. So break it into three steps. So let's see a few examples. So trans, this is a case of transradial styloid uh, scaphoelunate injury. You know it's a bando grade four. And again, uh, operative steps wise, make your skin flaps. Retinaculum, important, see I've only incised one centimeter. So you find your EPL, once you know that, incise uh, ulna words to it. And then, uh, so raise a strip of one centimeter of retinaculum. Capsule again, sorry. Capsule, you can see I've done a mayo flap. You don't need a big burger flap here. So little horizontal cut in the capsule, make a small flap, and you can start seeing lunate, scaphoid, and capitate. You do not need to see anything more. Preserve that dorsal reach, uh, ridge scaphoid capsular attachment because that's where the blood supply comes. And uh, you can see here, I'm holding the scaphoid ligament uh, in my forceps. And then of course you put your joysticks to correct your DC. And if I may show you this video, so this I borrowed from Prof BJ. And so now, oops, sorry. So concentrate here in this area. Now scaphoid and lunate are reduced. And you can see as prof will move it, now you can see a clear gap. So this is how you do a joystick. And once with the joystick, you've corrected the C, hold it with a clamp, and then put a wire from scaphoid to lunate, scaphoid to capitate to hold your DC. And these two are my joystick wires. And then finally, I do a washing line technique for my capsule odysseus. So anchor in scaphoid, anchor in unit, stitches will come out of capsule and you slap the capsule down. So looking at lunotricutral, so this is the sort of, uh, so you can see again, clearly bando lunotricutral injury. You can see there's a big step, both your first and second gilula lines are disrupted. Uh, and you can see here, in a lunotricutral unit will flex. So that's a VC and your angle will be less than uh, 30 degrees. And that's the test you do. And again, let's look at two examples. So 21 year old male. So again, it's an injury of young men in their second or third decade. You can again clearly see lunate is triangular. So it has flexed in this case, as you can see on a lateral radiograph, carpus is tending to fall off in the front. There's a step in the lun lunate and tricutrum. So you know it is a luno tricutral injury. Again, I've done a CT scan and you can clearly see lunate is flexed, corpus is falling off. This little fellow there represents your tricutral or capsular uh, avulsion. 
And then again, some II images. So again, unit flex, see where the capitate and the whole corpus in the hand is, it's completely off, falling off in the front. And this is what we are trying to achieve, unit looking in the normal uh, orientation. And these are the corresponding operative pictures. So uh, again, I've taken a radial base burger flap. This is me pointing intact scaphoid ligament. You can clearly see the luno tricuteral joint here. So you know the ligament is gone. And if I show you the video now, so this is lunate attached to your scaphoid. That's the luno tricuteral uh, joint. And if you watch carefully, there'll be a bit reduced, see? So reduced step, reduced. And now there's a big step between lunate and tricuteral, reduced and a big step. And if I show you the corresponding II images, you will see in a minute, see carpus falls off, now reduced. Carpus is falling off, so now reduced. So this is what you're trying to achieve. And then, so once you've got the carpus back on, once the lunate is looking right up in a neutral rotation, then yes, again, couple of wires, wire from tricutrum into hamate, wire from tricutrum into lunate. And then you can see how the carpus will now move as one. See, so there's no step between lunate and tricutrum now. Joint looks congruous, carpus is moving as one. So once you achieve that, you can see my holes there in the tricutrum and lunate. These, are, these were from my joysticking wires. Use these holes for your two anchors. Stitches come out through the capsule. That's my capsule. That's my radial base flap. As I put the knots, capsule will slap down uh, for capsulodesis. And again, corresponding II images, couple of wires, two anchors, stitches have come out on the dorsum of capsule for capsulodesis. Saurabh, you have uh, two minutes more. Okay, so I do a, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. I do a washing line technique. So this is what's happened. When a perilunate injury happens, the vertical septas uh, break. And by putting these anchors and stitching coming out through the capsule on the dorsum and putting tying these knots, I'm slapping the capsule back down for these vertical septas to heal up, which is what I've shown here. And, uh, Another example, 45 year old, uh, again- One moment, I didn't get that. Could you try again? Oh. Just carry on, that's fine. Sorry, Prof, can you hear me still? I'm sorry. Yes, yes, I think it could be from the recording. Don't worry, carry on. Sure, so another example, 45 year old male. Again, you can see important on PA radiograph is just to look at the lunate. It looks triangular. Then if I corroborate it to the lateral view, it is slightly flexing. So it has to be VC. It has to be a, a lunotricutral injury. So if you look for lunate on a PO radiograph and a lunate and a scaphoid lunate angle in the lateral radiograph, it will give you almost all the information that you want. That's the corresponding MRI, which confirms lunate subluxing dorsally and flexing and carpus is trying to adapt. This is carpal instability adaptive, if you like. And then, Again, because I was a bit not sure whether it was a grade four. So in this case, I did a wrist arthroscope. And if you see with my probe, which is sitting on a lunate, lunate is bouncing up and down. So I knew, but I couldn't see a clear lunotricutral gap. So this was a grade three. And then I proceeded to uh, open repair, same dorsal approach, find your EPL, then take a strip of retinaculum. You don't need to take all of it. So it stops bowstringing post-operatively. And then again, same mayo, small flap, enough to see your carpal bones. And then again, uh, again, I'm trying to show uh, joy, uh, how do you joystick and bring your carpus back on. So if you concentrate on this, just this wire, the horizontal wire, and see what happens. As I move the wire up, the whole carpus falls off, and then it comes back. And if I go back up again with the wire, see the whole carpus is subluxing. So this is how you do your joy, joystick. And once I'm happy, once my lunate is pointing up and the carpus is back onto the radius, now is the time to put these two wires uh, to hold my VC in the right position. 
And you can see the lunar tricuital joint now is congruous. There's no step. Gilula lines are normal. And then a couple of anchors. Then a couple of anchors. And with those anchors, the stitches have come out from the uh, dorsum of the capsule. And as I tie the knots, capsule will slap down and those vertical septa should scar up, should heal up. Finally, that one inch strip of retinaculum comes back and your retinaculum uh, repair. So fi now finally coming to perilunate injuries. So mechanism is the same, whether it's a scaphoid, whether it's a scaphoid, whether it's a trans-scaphoid perilunate, it's a spectrum, it's hyperextension, forces are coming from radial side going to the ulna side. Depending on the amount of force, you will have one or the other pattern. In a perilunate three, uh, Mayfield three, the corpus goes dorsally, and as capitate comes back and hits lunate, lunate comes out in the front, which is your Mayfield four. Remember your uh, volar radio lunate ligament is always intact, dorsal goes. That's why even in a frank lunate dislocation, AVN doesn't happen. So Mayfield recognized this and gave us four stages. Just for time sake, I'll go quickly. Scaphoid unit one, capital unit joint, two, lunotricutal ligament three, and finally your radio lunate. Lesser and greater arc. Uh, lesser arc is represented by this blue line. L for lesser, L for ligaments. So scaphoid unit and lunotricutal ligaments goes in lesser arc. Greater arc is a combination of any combination of bones or ligaments. Why do you want to treat them? Of course, in the short term, it's the pain, swelling, and the pressure, which needs to come off the medinner. In the long term, it's the collapse and instability and arthritis slack, which is what you're trying to prevent. One minute, uh, uh, Saurabh, please. Your screen isn't moving. Saurabh? Huh? Is it moving now? Yes. Oh. Yeah, it is moving. You have okay. one minute, Saurabh. Can you please? Okay, one minute. Sorry, I thought you wanted me. Okay. So perilunate, clinical acumen, very important because 25% can be missed in a, in a setting of a polytrauma. Lateral x-ray we've dis discussed about. Reduce and stabilize your ligaments and bones and joints. Reduction maneuver, again, traction counter traction. You extend and as you flex, the thumb pressure from the front, it'll reduce. So this is an example, uh, sort of 77, he came with this fracture dislocation, perilunate injury with a lunate extrusion, open injury, and you can see this lunate and you can see the lunate on a CT scan. So exam purposes, talk about your any &E management, how will you reduce it, your monitors, any &E research, BOA, BAPRAS guidelines, and then your definitive management. So this is how it looked, lunate came out open injury, so extend your incisions, pay attention to your cutaneous nerve, thorough debridement. And then of course, I extended carpal tunnel approach. And this is me showing space of poirier where I reduced it and lots of wires. I have to jump now. Sorry, I've got a minute left. Transcaphoid perilunate. You can see a transcaphoid fracture, lunotricutal ligament gone. So if you're shown a radiograph, as I was saying, there are no glula lines here. That's lunate, that's caphoid, that's the fracture. You can clearly see carpus is sitting at the back. That's your transcaphoid perilunate. Uh, if you see carefully, in fact, there's a transradial styloid also. So always get your CT scans. Dorsal approach, that's the transcaphoid fracture. You can see the carpus subluxing. Reduce all of it. Wire from the back. Then a variable angle screw. And this is how it should look eventually. So as I was telling you, lots of wires, lots of anchors. This is a three months of wires have come out. Another example is just to show you one more thing. That's your transcaphoid fracture. But look at this uh, little fellow there. This, so this indicates uh, this fellow there. So that's lunate, that's triutrum. So this indicates a vulsion of a lunotricutral ligament. So always look for this small uh, uh, piece of bone. So it again is a transcaphoid perilunate. Again, go from the dorsum as we've discussed, screw, wires to hold your lunotricutral and anchors as we have discussed in lunotricutral ligament injury. And this is how it should look in three months. Congruous joint and gilula lines restored in the lunotricutral joint. So I you, think uh, last two uh, slides, of last two slides, 30 seconds, if I may. Yeah. Trans radial styloid, we've already discussed. So every time you have a styloid fracture, as I said, forces come from radial side to the ulna side. Look for these careful unit injuries. If in doubt, put a scope. No need here because it's a grade four. 
And now you know how to deal with scaffold unit. So I'm going to dump this slide. And final slide to say, so patterns can be anything as you've seen. It can be a lesser arc. It can be any pattern from the radial side to the ulnar side in terms of bones and ligaments. If you look at this line three, that is a pure lunate injury. So if the forces have come through radial radiocarpal joint, goes through lunate and comes out, you can get a lunate fracture. Other situation you get a lunate fracture is kind box, AV and bone is weak and it fractures. Or you can have a frank radiocarpal uh, wrist dislocation, which is what I've shown in a, a green line. So any number of Hello. I think Saurabh's connection has dropped out. I think his so, connection is gone. Uh, we, I think uh, for the purposes of time, shall we move on, uh, Sunil? Yeah. So Yes, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think we'll take the question and then answers at the end. Hopefully, Saurabh can log on back again. So our next speaker is uh, Jonathan Jones, uh, who's a consultant hand surgeon at uh, Peterborough Hospitals and Northwest Anglia NHS Trust. Uh, he's passionate about teaching and training, and he also has a host of charitable activities. He's very active on the British Hand Society Overseas Committee, having overseen training in Malawi, and I'm very grateful for him to give his talk on the assessment of the injured hand, uh, which will be very useful to both orthopedic trainees and ED uh, uh, doctors as well. I'll just be sharing a screen as he has done a recording. Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me to teach on this BIOS uh, webinar series. I'm going to talk about the subject of assessment of the injured hand in 15 minutes. The learning objectives are to understand the history of injury. Hello. Anatomy, examination of the injured hand itself, investigations, when to x ray, introducing the simple five point hand injury assessment method importance of later evaluation and recording of your findings, and a bit on the mangled hand and assessment of open fractures. Hand injury will often follow. Pasturella multicida, and there are other pathogens that you need to be aware of. Can you hear now? The anatomy of the hand going from superficial to deep. Skin, vessels, tendons, and nerves down to the bone and joints. We go 28 in the hand. And the distance between the skin and the bone in the hand can be only three or four millimeters. So suddenly, a, a, a minor injury can, lead, can be quite severe in terms of involvement of neurovascular structures. Knowing the sensory innervation of the hand and the autonomous zones, the median ulnar and radial nerves. Being aware of the anatomy of the arches, superficial and deep palmar arches, and the radial and ulnar artery, and how to perform an Allen's test.
sense and tendon injury would involve the central. Amit, Amit, um, Amit, the, the sand keeps cutting out from the video. Hands. So the hand which has been lacerated, you can see this will be a zone two injury and it may involve skin, tendon, nerve, uh, probably not bone or joint in this one. And it'll be FDP, FDS, possibly radial and, and ulnar digital nerves. The importance of looking and then feel move secondarily. So the injury model assessment, superficial to deep, comes into play. And the more structures involved will lead to the a higher grade. So this is a laceration of a volar wrist. You can see that the likely injuries could well be flexor tendons, median nerve, possibly radial artery. Note the fingers are flail. Be aware of the extent of injury. Small lacerations may belie the importance of, of severe injury beneath. And there, there comes the point of evaluation with extension of the wounds at a later date. Contamination of the wounds, these will need to be debrided. Be aware of the tendon cascade. This is a normal cascade running from the index finger to the little finger and being able to do the tenodesis test, which is vitally important. And this comes as part of your um, inspection without even assessing the wound. One can determine whether an extensor tendon or a flexor tendon is injured. What's the diagnosis here? Even just by looking, we know that the flexor tendons to the index finger must have been divided, and there is a possibility of a median nerve injury. So use your powers of deduction and spend time on that initial looking and assessment before you move on to actually touching the patient. This is, an, there's obviously deformity in this finger. We can tell just by looking at this finger with the, um, that there is a rotational deformity of the ring finger. You can see in this position, in comparison to this position, where the rotation is more evident, and that this is likely to be a spiral fracture of the proximal phalanx of the ring finger. One could put local anesthetic in here as well um, to ascertain and then obtain an X-ray. Clinical signs may be evident on the patient, and you can see here the first dorsocentrosis wasting, and then the association with a claw of the finger. And then if you look carefully at the bottom left, there's a lacerate, there's a scar, healed scar over the wrist, which would lead to a sensory deficit in the ulnar nerve distribution. When do we x-ray? Well, if there's a high energy injury, then we're going to be, have a lower threshold for x-ray. If there's any local bone or joint tenderness, likely to, to have one. And if there's pain on moving the joint, but you're likely to, to have a, a lower threshold for x-ray. And we're still missing lots of fractures these days. Hamate metacarpal fractures, scaphoid fractures. Um, so it's better to be, uh, uh, to x-ray than not. Use your suspicion. Be aware of this sort of uh, injury on a, in, on a PIP joint. The importance of the rule of twos to get a, a lateral of the joint. And this shows a typical subluxation with a volar plate injury, bony volar plate injury, and dorsal subluxation with a V sign dorsally. Or with the X-ray, the mallet finger, and look at the percentage of joint um, surface involvement. And the application of a simple mallet splint, even at that first assessment, um, can set the treatment in the right direction for further follow-up diligently. Beware of blood under the nail. And a sub hematoma is effectively an open fracture uh, with a, a distortion of the nail bed and a fracture underneath. Ring avulsions is a common severe injury and um, can involve damage to the neurovascular structures. And this is really quite a severe injury. And there's a grading 
for the Urbaniac grading, which you need to be aware of for the exam. The diagnosis here. The pattern is wrong. The tenodesis test would show that this is, this, uh, there's some deformity here. There's some bruising on the pulp of the finger. What might this be? So a flexor tendon injury, but it's associated with a fracture. And this is a jersey finger. You can see uh, the um, flake of bone with attached to the FTP tendon, which has retracted back to um, the A3 pulley. And there's a leddy and pack classification for this, which you need to um, know the, the, the range of these injuries. And these, these, are, and these need a timely diagnosis and reduction. Do you have any concerns about this x-ray? So the finger pulp is looking a little dusky. So we're concerned about a vascular injury. And the vessels being the most important part of that um, assessment method. So this needs timely intervention uh, to save the tip of the finger. So when we have a vascular injury, um, early, early assessment in theatre, and to see whether some uh, fingertip can be salvaged. This fingertip does seem to be still viable, but and is actually surviving on one pedicle. And so it may well be that a simple uh, reduction of the, of the uh, finger and K-wiring um, can lead to the survival of the uh, fingertip. X-rays may be discussed in this in this way, and we see here that the, the typical example of a, of, that a fracture is a soft tissue injury complicated by a break in the bone. And this is really a, a sort of replant situation where the clock is ticking. It's a severe injury, grade five injury involving uh, skin, tendon, nerve, a vessel, bone, and joint. And we need to remember to uh, transport the uh, uh, amputated finger in a separate plastic bag so that it's not um, uh, against the ice when it's been transported with the patient to a uh, trauma unit. And know your cold and warm skin your times. Beware of the fight bites. An importance that in a, in a fight bite, sometimes the initial injury is not apparent because the position of the tendon uh, when the uh, injury happens is not visible because when the finger is extended, that uh, the tendon injury is not uh, um, evident. And this is often lead to serious infection um, um, of the, uh, the MCP joint. And treatment for this needs to be timely at the beginning. Have a low threshold for exploring these uh, as a local anaesthetic. When you're extending your wounds on the hand, um, either in it, either in ED, then there are various ways to do this. And on the flexor surface, it's normally Brunner's incisions and oblique incisions, and on the dorsum, uh, extensor um, uh, longitudinal incisions. And this will give you a full diagnosis. And this picture earlier on showed those very small wounds. And this is how you, you'd, you'd evaluate the, these wounds um, to find out that in fact there was a, an open um, joint injury for the middle finger. Yeah. Onto the management of the mangled hand, that really is exactly uh, the same as or the assessment of the, of the injured hand in normal circumstances, history, initial assessment, you relieve the pain, you wash the wound with copious amounts of uh, saline, antibiotic treatment, and extend and evaluate as necessary. But there is an emphasis on stabilization of the fractures um, and then repair and soft tissue cover later with reconstruction and the importance of rehabilitation. Just uh, worth knowing that there are some scoring systems uh, for the hand with the hand injury severity score and also the mangled extrem extremity severity score. Uh, these are, whilst, we, whilst we're aware of them, they don't necessarily um, uh, practically uh, particularly useful. Um, and it, it would be for our, in terms of clinical practice, 
that we should lean heavily towards in initial salvage. So don't amputate an, um, anything or reset too aggressively um, if there is uh, in the, the first of and there's always a, always a chance to come back at the 48 hour period. But be aware that these scoring systems exist. There is a classification of open hand fractures um, by McLean. Uh, Mattel in 1991, we should look up. And this is uh, really based on the Castillo and Anderson uh, classification for open fractures. And it has um, type one being less than a centimeter with a clean wound, type two being over a centimeter with a clean wound, um, no peristyle still stripping. And then over a centimeter, type three is an over a centimeter, but with contamination and crush injury or blast. So it's good to have an idea of these. And the majority of the type ones and twos may well be treated in the ED um, with, you know, with simply wound uh, cleaning under local anesthetic and splinting. And always try and remember that you, you should always splint a hand in the position of safe immobilization. And that's with, uh, um, with even clothes, with closed injuries as well as open. And then be aware that the, the type three or type two, type three may need um, early transfer to theatre for a proper evaluation and um, assessment and initial stabilisation with KWAS uh, or possibly external fixation. So in terms of the um, uh, summary, a quick uh, assessment of the injured hand, is that the majority of, uh, of the injury assessment really is, you to, is the history, getting a good history at the beginning with our knowledge of clinical anatomy and a careful examination, um, the importance of um, examination and evaluation of the injury and the full evaluation of the extent of the injury may not be known until a patient comes to theatre. So it may well be that a laceration on the finger, um, which may be called skin laceration, possible tendon injury, plus minus digital nerve or artery injury. Investigation with x-rays. Remember the five point hand injury assessment and that a very small wound could, un could um, be indicative uh, of a more severe injury beneath the skin. And a ring abulsion is a good example of that. Do record uh, the, the assessment carefully. Um, and be aware of the, um, of the treatment of the mangled hand and the uh, classification for open branches. Um, I hope that's been helpful for you and uh, very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, that was a very clear and concise uh, presentation on how to manage the acutely injured hand. Uh, I am sorry we had some intermittent loss of sound but uh, you are here to take some questions. Uh, one of the things that I found very important uh, to mention again is the fact that you said that the skin is only a few millimeters away from bone, joint, and tendon. And that's very important to remember because you have this problem whereby uh, people are not necessarily adequately treated because of the poor initial assessment in the emergency department, which leads to a really very significant complications. Uh, so I'll open it up to the Q&A. Uh, is there, uh, so for the, uh, one of the questions we have is, for the McLean type two and three injuries, uh, the emergency department, this is a question from an ED physician, uh, the ED is expected to refer directly to hand surgeons offsite. Uh, this is at uh, their hospital. Uh, would it not be more appropriate for ED to refer to local orthopods to review an ED and give an opinion in ED? Thanks very much. And uh, yeah, for the question, uh, I, I knew that, that question would come up, in fact, because uh, I think it, it, it does depend, doesn't it, on the, uh, on the uh, facility within ED with procedure rooms and so forth. But um, I think there's a, there's a, a lot of these um, open fractures that are, are not comminuted and are very clearly to see what the problems are, um, can be treated in ED. But um, uh, obviously, if, if anything is going to need anything in terms of internal fixation or K-wire stabilisation, um, I think involvement of orthopaedics and, and seeing the patient in ED would be appropriate, um, if that's your question. Um, 
and I think uh, uh, definitive treatment can be done in, in the ED department as long as it, you've got a reasonably clean area to treat these injuries. Um, so um, uh, uh, what you don't want to do is to build in unnecessary delays um, with going to another, another centre. Um, so um, I think the, the grade threes will obviously be referred off. But uh, to be honest, my, my summary uh, for this question would be that um, my, my experience is that um, ED physicians or, and orthopaedic teams who are seeing patients in ED, um, they need to be, have, have a low threshold for giving local anaesthetic and giving a thorough washout and, and, uh, uh, for these wounds and, and splinting them so that you, you're, you're, you're buying time for later. Um, if you've got the skills and, and uh, the facilities and the decent suture uh, packs and packs loops, then you can suture up things in, in ED, but, 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 uh, but probably um, tendon repairs and, and fixation of, and K-wiring things, obviously that's, that's for a, a theatre setting, if that's helpful. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. I think that's the most important thing that you have to assess the problem correctly and then decide on who is the best person to approach it. Uh, we have some. Gonna, yeah, sorry. Yeah, go just on. Pick up one thing, um, Amit, was that when, when, when my voice went silent in the talk, I just wanted to pick up the, there was um, just to be aware for the trainees of the uh, different bacteria in different environments. And, uh, and cat bites with the pustulella multicida um, and, and other, other bacteria that you can get from the, if you're people who keep tropical fish and mycobacterium and things like that. So those are often, they often come up in exams, uh, different bacteria specific to the different um, environment. Yeah, Perfect. and animals. What, what sort of antibiotic cover would you advise augmenting for these uh, as a, uh, with wide spectrum coverage? Augmenting would be appropriate um, yeah. indeed for those, yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, all these videos, uh, the video as well as the talks are all available on the BIOS YouTube channel for people who want to check in on this register and you can watch it anytime. Uh, Saurabh is back again now. Uh, there was a question for you, Saurabh. Uh, sorry you could not uh, continue because I think you lost power. But uh, the question was from, uh, from somebody who wanted to know how you would differentiate a TFCC injury from a lunotriquitral injury. Right, okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, and sorry to everyone. Actually, it was my power. But I just wanted to say it was the last slide. There was nothing more to add. And uh, wish you all the best and thank you for listening. Now, answer to this is, so both will have ulnar-sided pain. For a lunotriquitral, your lateral x-rays are your best friend. It will show lunar flexing. And then, of course, on our PA radiograph, you will have that step which I showed you. You will have that space in unotriquitral uh, joint which I showed you. Now, sometimes if it's a subtle grade two stroke, grade three unotriquitral injury, you can always uh, do MR arthrograms. You can always do a wrist arthroscopy with a view to open it and fix the ligaments, as I did in one of the uh, two cases. As regards TFCC, you can stress the TFCC ligament and have a feel. Other thing to dis dis uh, differentiate would be a ECU tendonitis. So again, uh, differentiate between your TFCC and your ECU, and then you can send them for an ultrasound uh, with a view to give a targeted uh, steroid injection. So, so, okay. so in a nutshell, is your X-rays, MR arthrograms, sometimes even a CT arthrogram, depending on if they can't have an MRI to pick up uh, those grade two stroke three, not bando lunotriquitrals, or even for TFCC. So the, uh, thank you very much, Saurav. The other question was, and which is often asked in the exam is that you've got a patient who's come in with a perilunate injury, uh, transcaphoid or a, just a soft tissue, lesser arc injury, and the lunates popped out from the space of Poirier. And uh, the patient comes to you in the middle of the night with this injury. Uh, what is the advice for treating this? Would you go ahead and treat it in the middle of the night? Who should treat it? The sure. It's a very good question. Thank you. Yeah, very good question. Thank you. So it's a Mayfield 4. It's a lunate dislocation. So few things to remember. Lunate will come out in the front through the carpal tunnel. And it will come out just proximal to it, not inside it. Uh, so first thing is to obviously assess if it's open, closed, and the median nerve symptoms because it pushes the median nerve next to the skin. So you can attempt a close reduction in the a &E 
obviously mentioned registra and monitors and painkillers and antidotes uh, with the maneuver which I showed you. More often than not, it should reduce. If the examiner then says, well, you've tried in any &E and it's not reducing and patient has need and nerve symptoms. Now, again, remember two things. One, the contusion to the median nerve has happened at the time of unit protrusion or extrusion in the front. That's already happened. That damage to the nerve has happened, which it will recover with time. So, so for practical purposes, as a consultant, if my lower limb colleague or my registrar rings me, I'm in no rush to even do an extended carpal tunnel approach in the middle of the night. Exam purposes, play safe. Say, I'm going to speak to my uh, uh, sort of hand surgeon colleague and then say I'll do an extended carpal tunnel approach. Nothing more, just from the front. Little, little thing to mention, as you cut the skin, nerve is just next to the skin because lunate is already out. It's a space occupying lesion. Nerve is just close to the skin. So beware of that. Protect your nerve and then uh, your lunate should reduce through the space of pyria. That's all you need to do. Then put a plaster slab and then your hand colleague can take over. There's no rush now. You can do a dorsal approach and repair the ligaments uh, at, at the opportune moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Saurav. That is fairly clear uh, advice for trainees, either when they're on their own in the night or when they are appearing for exams uh, like this one. Uh, thank you. Anand, thank you for your talk. I wanted to ask you about uh, the uh, whether you have any thoughts on what might be considered as the gold standard for treating the elderly uh, basal thumb arthritis, which is a pan-trapezial grade four low demand. Uh, would you say a trapezectomy or a trapezectomy with ligament interposition? Uh, do you have any thoughts on whether the dorsal ligaments play an effective role or would you just say that uh, the simple trapezectomy is the gold standard? Thank you. I mean, thanks, Amit. There is uh, enough evidence in the literature that a simple trapezectomy or one of the variations of the trapezectomy, it doesn't make much difference in the results. So I know a lot of people, including some of my colleagues, they, they do associate it, you know, LRTI or ligament interposition or something like that with the trapezectomy. I mean, what I have you know, sort of come down now, I do stabilize the base of the first metacarpal. So earlier I used to make a hole into the corner of the first metacarpal, taking a strong suture like a number two fiber wire and, and tie it with the nearby soft tissues. But after talking to some other colleagues, what I have changed now is to put two anchors one into the first metacarpal base, one into the second metacarpal base, and then tie them together in an attempt to reduce the subsidence of the first metacarpal. Now, I haven't done any sort of proper audit about it, so I have no evidence to that, but on a sort of uh, anecdotal basis, the patients which I've seen later on into the clinic, I have seen that this seems to work, but mm -hmm. overall, uh, trapezectomy is still a good operation, and uh, obviously the group you described, elderly, elderly patients, low demand, pantrapezial arthritis, it should work. There is a small proportion of patients which are unhappy after trapezectomy. And in those patients, the various regions, including the significant proximal migration or other regions are there, and that is a difficult group to treat. And the important thing is that you can't predict it preoperatively, that which patients are not going to do well. But I think more or less, uh, so far, uh, I would think that the two options would be a trapezectomy with stabilization of first metacarpal or the first CMCJ replacement. To me, in the, these, in the elderly group of the patient, type three or four, these are the two viable options. So what is a question, Anand, to ask what position you would place the thumb when you are stabilizing with the suture anchors? Oh, you, you don't have an option for that because, because the suture anchor would not, uh, would not uh, uh, make one position of the thumb. Basically, you just 
you just keep these two metacarpals uh, together. So basically the first metacarpal base, you can't uh, uh, sort of stabilize it in, a, in any positions of the adduction, abduction or rotation. It is basically just to stop the proximal migration. So position, position, I don't think you can decide with that one. It's basically the two nearest point on the first and second metacarpal, you put the anchors and tie them together. No, you can't, you can't sort of uh, kind of control the rotations of the position of the thumb in that way with this situation, with this position. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one more last question. What do you think is the current place for trapezium metacarpal arthroplasty, like the joint replacements you talked about? Uh, and uh, uh, do you think we have enough evidence to support their more general use where appropriately indicated? And oh yes, and plenty of evidence now. Plenty of evidence now. I have given some references there. There are more are available. The only thing is that for some reason in the UK, it is not popular. I do not know why, whether people doesn't want it to change the traditional trapezectomy, thinking that trapezectomy give good results. But there are certain comparative studies. And the latest uh, reference I gave was in 2019, General of Hand Surgery. And in the Europe, there is, it is being done very, very widely. And having done you know, several of these cases, I'm personally convinced that this is a good operation. And my feeling is that, that even in the elderly population, why we should not give them the benefit of an operation which is better, which gives them sooner good pain relief, predictable results, good movements, and good stability. Just because somebody is 80 years of old and some you know, person, elderly person lives on her own, we should not give her a kind of an, um, a, a stepmotherly treatment that, okay, this patient doesn't require a joint replacement. It's just like a hip replacement. You know, uh, you give a hip replacement to 80 years old, 80 plus years old, mainly for the pain relief. So same thing is that my feeling is that I'm sort of all for it. A well done first CMCJ replacement, especially the latest three generation, third generation implants, they're absolutely wonderful. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, that's his hand up. Sorry. So when you're back again. Thank you. Yeah, can you can you hear me, uh, Amit? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Go on. So I think Anand made some very good points. The issue obviously is that a, a girdle stone arthroplasty causes a lot of problems. I mean, it's really not an option when it comes to hip arthroplasty or you know you wouldn't do something like that to the knee. The problem here is that the trapezectomy works well. It's worked well for many years and is definitely what I would call probably the gold standard. The difference between the joint replacement and a trapezectomy is that you get moving very, very quickly, but it comes at a great cost. So one of the things that we have to prove conclusively is that the, the improvement in the, the ability to do things quicker lasts over a long period of time. So if those graphs both coincide, say for example, at one year, and that improvement does not last, how does the country, how, does the, how do people justify uh, doing something that costs so much compared to something like a trapezectomy, which costs next to nothing. And the second thing is that joint replacements bring on their own set of complications. There's a whole different set of complications like dislocation, which is not an issue, but loosening later on. So if you do it in a younger person, you do it in an older 80 year old, like Anand said, it will loosen very quickly because the bone could be soft. So I am, I'm convinced that, you know, that is the future. But um, I don't think we've answered that question. Yet. That's all I want to say. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have had a very excellent uh, webinar uh, this morning on hand and uh, conditions. Uh, very, very well uh, described and uh, put forward by all the speakers. I'm going to ask uh, Sunil to give a vote of thanks to all our panelists today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amit. Uh, Saurabh, do you have uh, something to say very quickly? Uh, no, it's okay, Sunil. Then I let go because. Okay, thank you. I, it's, thank it's, you. it's time. I think it's twelve thirty-eight. Uh, thank you very much, all the panelists, for uh, sparing their wonderful Sunday morning for this very noble cause, which is education of the trainees. So the British Indian Orthopedic Society is very, very grateful for your time this morning, and we hope to get in touch with you soon for another exciting session. Thanks to my co-host uh, Amit for uh, uh, organizing this, and thanks very much again, gents. Uh, these, this video with your permission and blessing will be available on the BIOS YouTube channel for everyone to benefit from. Thank you again. We sign off now. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you for checking the post. Thank you. Have a Thank good you. Sunday. Thank you.
Thank you for your time, Jonathan, as well. Thank you. It's a great pleasure, and it's, a, no it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Sunil. Good to Thank see you. all of you, Anand, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you.